Well, greetings, future social workers. Welcome back to Case Management, and thank you for joining me for this week's lecture. This week's lecture in particular is gonna cover a couple of things. Uh, we're gonna start slow in an introduction to some basic fundamentals to consider when providing case management to your clients, okay? Um, so we're gonna start nice and easy. I'm going to give you some overview of case management in a, in a simple form, and what we're also going to do for today's lecture is talk about wraparound. Now, many of you have seen, if you reviewed the syllabus for this course, that wraparound is woven into um, the course materials. The reason for that is because the, the sort of realm of case management that you will be, be stepping into as social workers, whether you're working with children or families, or whether you're working with adult populations, veterans, or even homeless populations, what's important to consider is that wraparound has become a fundamental template for case management. So what I'm going to do is we will start at the beginning, as they say in Alice in Wonderland, and when we get to the end, we will stop, right? And so the idea behind this is, is that today, for the sake of this course, we are going to talk about the intro, the basics to case management, and what we're also going to discuss is an introduction to wraparound. Where did wraparound come from? Why are we talking about it in a social work class, and what does it mean for your future careers? I promise you, as I stated in the first lecture, everything that I give you in this course will be 100% relevant to your future careers. I'm excited to pass along this wraparound training to you, and we'll get into that in a second, okay? So um, for the first portion, we'll go ahead and dive into the uh, lecture. Let me go ahead and share my screen. All right, here we are. So welcome, like I said, back to Case Management 535. We will go ahead and commence with our lecture for today, for this week. Um, like I said before, class structure will stay the same. Today's content uh, will change because we are discussing intro to case management and wraparound in particular. So, as many of you know, I or may have heard, is I'm also a huge Star Wars fan. I'm a Captain Marvel, well, Marvel Comics, I'm sorry, fan in general. My daughter's a huge Captain Marvel fan. Um, and uh, I'm also this huge Star Wars fan. And so any chance that I get to uh, show Star Wars clips or a Marvel comic movie, Avengers, anything like that uh, clips, I will show them in class and use them as analogies for the purpose of our lectures. And so I have a really great film clip here. Sorry, caffeine break. A really quick uh, video clip here from Star Wars Empire Strikes Back. The reason I want to start with this is because I want to set the premise, okay, uh, for an intro to case management. Something to consider, all right, about case management that I've learned over the past 15 years. So, some of you may be familiar with the scene. If you're not, that's absolutely okay. You don't need to know Star Wars in order to get the analogy that I'm going to make between Star Wars and uh, case management. But what we're going to do is I'm going to move into this film clip. This is, like I said, from Empire Strikes Back. And it is when Han Solo and his crew in the Millennium Falcon are attempting to escape the Empire. And they are chasing him, you know, through space and their spaceships. And Han Solo picks an asteroid field to go into to evade the evil Empire. So that's the background on this. And to set this up, what I'd ask for you to do is as you watch this clip, I'd like for you to pay attention to the style in which Han Solo communicates, and let's talk about his behavior. So pay attention to two things. How does Han Solo communicate to his team, okay, while he's uh, navigating through this asteroid field? And the second thing is, how is Han Solo behaving towards his team and also in the situation to move through this particular scene? So without further ado, what we're gonna do is go ahead and jump into this film clip and we will play this. It's, it's only three, uh, about four minutes long. And we will come back to the intro for case management. So here we go. Oh, yeah? Watch this. Watch what? 
Okay, so I hope you found that clip entertaining. I love that particular clip. I love that movie in the series. One of my favorites, actually, of the entire series. Um, so what does Star Wars have to do with case management, right? Some of you are thinking, why did we just spend four minutes watching this particular clip? So a couple of things I'd like to draw your attention to in the clip. I asked you to go ahead and take a look at and, and observe how was Han Solo communicating um, to his team, the style and communication, and second, how was he behaving? So a couple of reflective questions I'd like, you to ask, I'd like to ask you to consider while you are watching this particular clip. So Han Solo, his, would you describe his communication style in this, in this particular clip as uh, directive driven or what we would refer to as question oriented? In other words, was Han Solo offering more directives or was he asking questions in this scene? Many of you know that the obvious response to this is, is that he was more directive driven, right? We saw evidence of that when he was giving orders like shut up, or, you know, and, or shut him up or shut him down. And he was talking about, go ahead, Chewie, turn on the deflector shields. And he was giving a lot of orders to everyone about what they should do, right? Now, during the scene, what was absent from this and in, in a directive driven model, what's often absent is if you notice, Han Solo didn't ask his team for any sort of insight. He didn't ask his team some ideas on how to proceed to get out of this situation, right? Um, um, Han Solo didn't ask for feedback in terms of his decision on whether or not this was going to work for everyone else. If you notice, Han Solo went with his plan and he implemented that on his own, right? Now, a second piece to understand about this scene in particular was the question, I mean, think about this, was Han Solo's behavior in this particular scenario more reactive or proactive? Okay, so think about for that for a second. Han Solo's actions in this particular scene, were they more reactive or were they more proactive? Many of you would say he was more reactive, right? So Han Solo didn't go into this particular scenario with a plan A, B, and C, and he didn't shift over into those plans. If you notice what Han Solo did during the scene was react and he moved 
from one situation to the next as the situation changed. So Han Solo was out there and he was trying to evade those troops and tried to jump into hyperspeed, uh, hyperspace. That didn't work. And so then all of a sudden he gets bumped by an asteroid, decides we're going into the asteroid field, decides to go deeper into it, and then he eventually evades and takes cover within an asteroid, right? So the idea behind this is, is Han Solo's um, behavior was directive driven, giving directives and not seeking a transactional relationship between him and those, those involved in the situation. And the second thing was Han Solo was more reactive in the situation, changing his behavior based on um, the challenges placed in front of him. My entire point with this is what often makes for great movies doesn't usually make for great case management, okay? In a nutshell, if you take anything from this lecture, what I'd like you to take from this is, is that in a, an effective case management strategy, as a social worker, when you are working with people's lives, what you want to be able to do is, in, is take a question-orientated approach, and you want to enter a case plan with a proactive mentality. In other words, you don't want to be Han Solo moving through this asteroid field not in case management. So one thing to consider is in case management, you will have times of crisis, okay? You are gonna have an asteroid field appear before you, right? You're gonna to need to adapt and make decisions. However, the overarching theme, okay, and tone of your case plan, along with how you interact with others who are involved in that case plan, cannot be isolating others, including your client, and it needs to be collaborative in nature and it needs to be proactive, which means you need to go in, okay, to this plan with intentionality and in what you're gonna be doing with your client and your team, all right, in order to move the client or the family, whoever you're working with, from one end of the case plan to the other, okay? So a couple of big lessons that I learned over the past 15 years in providing case management directly to the clients that I serve is you wanna begin with the end in mind. Whenever you begin to sit down and conduct an assessment with one of your clients, what you want to do is say, where is it that we as a team, you as a client, us as collaborators with you, where do we want to be at the end of this process? And now let's start building a plan to make steps towards that end. Think about it in this way. When many of you go on a vacation, you talk about your destination first, right? You brainstorm, here's where I want to be. Here's where I want to spend my time and my money. Um, and, and I want to enjoy myself in this setting. So that's your destination. And what you start doing is saying, so now that let's say we want to go to Disney World, all right, um, then you're going to consider Disney World is my end, okay? Now, where is, what am I going to need to do to accomplish the goal of making it from today to Disney World by this date, right? So you're going to talk about saving, and you're going to talk about where's the best place to get a deal, and what tickets you want to buy, and where do you want to stay, and you're going to accomplish those goals as you move along. So you want to begin with the end in mind. A mantra that I shared with all of my case managers over the past 15 years, especially when I moved into upper management positions, was always this mantra of plan your work and then work your plan, all right? So what's really important to understand in case management is you want to be deliberate. You never want to go into a meeting ad hoc and just saying, we're going to see what happens today when I sit down with this family. You always want to be implementing a plan, and then you want to work that plan. Um, many times you'll hear social workers that are highly effective in case management saying, trust the process. Trust the process. As I talk about wraparound today, what I'm going to ask you to do is say, trust the process. When I share with you the steps to wrap around over the course of this term, all you need to know is, is that you don't need to be an expert in everything that you do or have all the answers as a case manager, okay? All you need to know is the process, and once you trust in that process, it works, okay? And that's why I'm going to present to you the wraparound model throughout this course. Some key tips that as you work through your case plan and when you start providing case management, okay, to your clients, one thing is you want to be strengths-driven and needs, strengths-based and needs-driven. That's going to make a lot more sense to you as we move along throughout the term. Your strategies and your outcome measures in your case plan want to be consistent. And we're going to talk about in this course specifically identifying the difference between what is a need and what is a strategy, okay? Now, in a case plan, you are going to want to identify both. You're going to need to talk about the needs of your client. What does your client need to make it to that end? Remember, begin with the end in mind, to make it to that vacation spot where they want to go. But you're also going to talk about the individual strategies, the things that need to be done and accomplished during that time. Now, many of you have also heard in my first lecture that I talked about 
is that we need to be able to measure the progress of our clients, right? So we can't just sit and say in a court report, well, I think things are getting better, or you know what, I hope they're gonna get better in about a couple of days or a couple of weeks. No, what we actually have to do is be able to quantify the progress of our clients in our case plan. For that, the biggest tool that I can give you related to quantifying progress of a person's behavior and their goals as they meet their treatment goals or their case plan goals is going to be considering frequency, duration, and intensity. These three words right here will be the premise for how you build strategies in a non-clinical case plan, as well as how you establish treatment goals in a clinical plan. So either way, if you're gonna be a social worker that works macro or micro, if you're gonna be community or clinical in terms of your focus throughout your career, you will still need to pay attention to the notion of frequency, duration, and intensity. Don't worry, you don't need to get all that information today. I'm going to talk about frequency, duration, and intensity in a later lecture, okay. Very good. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna start with a brief history of wraparound. Some of you may be familiar with wraparound. Some of you who have entered into this program have already had a, a, a light intro to wrap because you've heard of it in other settings in which you've worked or maybe you've spent a little time communicating with social workers or case managers who work in wraparound. Um, some of you, this may be the first time you hear about it. This is particularly an area that I'm very excited to bring to this course because I have spent the last 12 years working and providing wraparound at the individual level with the clients, the children that I've served in foster care settings, with their families as the children are reunited home, with many times their families of origin, their biological families, or stabilizing foster placements, um, children who um, were active in gangs, and we were attempting to move them away from that life providing the wraparound model. And later in my career, what I also did was supervise wraparound teams, later supervised and expanded wraparound programs. And then uh, to this day, I currently advocate at the state level in some work groups related to wraparound implementation of policy at the state level. So wraparound for me is a system, a modality of case management that aligns perfectly with the general interventionist model okay that is a highly effective tool for providing case management over the years i've had about 15 years of experience in total providing wraparound to clients and families when i say that all you need to do is trust the process that's being that really means uh is the truth okay all you need to do is trust this process of wraparound now one of the things that we've committed to in this program is that we will I literally spend a semester giving you wraparound and little bits of training so that when you leave, you will understand the general intervention model for case management because wraparound falls underneath that, but you will specifically be trained in the wraparound model, okay? Now, some of you may be saying, but why wraparound in particular? Why out of any other ways to provide case management, you know, that may align with the general interventionist model, why would I need to learn wraparound? Well, that's a good question, something to consider. In the state of California, remember when I stopped, talked to my first lecture related to KDA implementation and the Continuum of Care Reform Act. Basically what they did was they drew down from wraparound because of its effectiveness in working with so many populations, and they said this is now the standard for how we are going to provide case management throughout the entire state of California, okay? So what's really important to understand is that when you step into the field, of social work, what you may hear is some people saying, well, it's a version of rap or it's like rap and all of these things. And that may be true, but what they're saying is that the standard that's been set, okay, for foster youth in California, for children and families involved in care, um, for kiddos on probation and receiving mental health services, is that wraparound has become the standard of case management in the state of California, which is why I'm excited to bring this to you because you will be prepared beyond others, okay, um, when stepping into the field. Now, what's also important to understand is some of you are saying, well, I wanna work with veteran populations, I wanna work with aging adults, do I still need to learn wraparound? Yes, because it aligns with the general interventionist model. All right, and in particular, particularly within California and other states, wraparound is not only being applied to children and families, it's also being applied and engaged in a process with uh, veterans, uh, aging populations, um, and other populations throughout the country, okay? So wraparound isn't just a California thing, it is a national movement, and on top of that, wraparound is not only for foster youth and their families, 
wraparound has been adopted now and adapted all right, to provide services to multiple populations. So if you can leave having an overview and wrap, this will make you stronger as a professional in your case management services. All right, with that disclaimer, let's jump into where did wraparound come from in relation to California, okay? So like I said, wraparound is implemented in several states. I've had the opportunity to check out wrap in Missouri. Uh, we've talked about wrap in Nebraska during my career, wraparound. Um, and wraparound services as they exist in Massachusetts and some other states, and it is fantastic to see. But we're gonna talk about the, the origin of wraparound in California, because that's important to understand. So some people will say that wraparound in particular is this new program. Sometimes you'll still run into social workers saying, yeah, you know, we've got this fancy program, it's called wraparound, it's brand new, it's really effective. Uh, and it would seem that wraparound kind of just came out of nowhere over a period of time. I would like to offer you though that the true origin of RAP has actually been in the process since the 1970s, not only as a country in multiple states, but also throughout the state of California in its development. There were several landmark um, um, acts, uh, if you will, or policies that were put in place that led to the origin of wraparound. So yes, maybe wraparound didn't exist in 1975, but as a, as a child services division, as social workers in our field, we started to move towards wraparound in the 1970s. And so there was this program in Chicago uh, called the Kaleidoscope Program, which in 1975 was a big deal because what it said was, is that we've recognized that one agency can't do everything. One agency can't be an expert at, let's say, foster care and serving aging adults and also serving veteran populations and serving this and that, okay? The idea behind it was is that uh, um, Chicago basically said, look, there are agencies who have a niche and their niche in particular is maybe with one population. What we need to do is allow those, those particular agencies to have that expertise in that area, and we ought to contract with those agencies who have that expertise so that the services the clients need that relate to that population receive the best possible services. So rather than adopt this sort of systemic view that one size fits all, and everyone deserves the same resources in the same time, because that's not always necessarily true, um, or the same background and training, what they're saying is, well, let's allow our agencies who have expertise to tailor the services so they need to our populations. Now, in 1985, 10 years later, the Alaska Youth Initiative was implemented. Now, this one took things a step further. What it said was every client in particular doesn't need the same resources. Every client doesn't always necessarily need um, a food bank. Every client doesn't always necessarily need a tutor. Every client doesn't always necessarily need to find a place of worship and whatever the case is. And so what it said was we need to further individualize our approach, not only as a system, but our approach as case managers and individuals who are serving people who need help. In other words, our plans need to be what we call highly individualized, okay? And what that means is as social workers, we want to avoid what we call a cookie cutter approach. You all have seen cookie cutters. When you lay dough out on a tray and you stamp cookies, right? Or they're the same size and they look exactly the same. Well, a cookie cutter approach doesn't work for, for um, clients that we serve. We have to recognize that each of our clients come with individual needs and our plan, our case plan needs to be tailored to every single client that we are working with, okay? It needs to look unique to them. Now, in 1992, here's what's interesting, is EMQ, which is an agency actually that changed their name recently, not, well, fairly recently, to Uplift, okay, um, uh, launched its first wraparound program as a pilot program in 1992. Now, the reason they did this, in a, in a brief nutshell, was in the state of California, there were some longitudinal studies that were done that followed kids from a very young age up to the point where they were 18. Now, some of you may or may not know this, but when a child turns 18 in our system, we refer to that child at that point exiting the system as being emancipated. They are then emancipated from the system. I've always thought that's very interesting that we use the word as a system of emancipation when we know that that word has tied to other involuntary ways of servitude right in the past, particularly with slavery as a history of this country. Yet we say that we are emancipating children. I thought that's always just interesting. But anyway, side note. The point was, is that in this longitudinal study, what they found was when a child was removed from a family setting, meaning either from their biological family for abuse or neglect that's taken place, or maybe something really bad happens in the family's lives and the parents pass away, 
Um, but when we moved children from a non-family setting into an institutional setting, such as a group home or what we call, refer to as residential care, all right? Sometimes you would have heard the term group home. If we put them into non-family settings and they were raised by an institution, what we discovered was is that children become institutionalized, right? And so some of you have heard the statement in regards to individuals who are incarcerated, right? That there's a notion of institutionalization that takes place when an individual lives outside of a setting that is not, um, does not mirror the real world outside of those walls, they become acclimated to living life in an institution. That doesn't work well when they have to tr transition into right, the main community setting. And so what they found was also that kids who had been removed from their families of origin for abuse and neglect, no matter how atrocious those were, once they were emancipated at 18, their outcomes weren't good. Many of those children slash now becoming adults were homeless. Many of them dependent on other services, public services, in order to feed themselves or, or uh, try to have a roof over their head. Some of those individuals actually had to commit crimes in order to just to survive. And what they saw was is that in many of those cases, a large amount of those cases, when children then um, were, were um, needing more support, what they often did at that point um, was they returned to their families of origin. They returned to those families, okay? What I'm gonna do is, um, let me see here. Let me pause the recording really quickly. I'm sorry about that. Okay, I'm sorry about that. I had some sort of weird alarm going off in the, uh, in the uh, other room, and so I had to deal with that. I apologize. So. When we left off, what we were talking about was the notion that when kids, no matter how abused or neglected um, they were, when they emancipated and they turned 18, oftentimes what we also discovered was they returned to their families of origin, okay? So no matter how atrocious that abuse was, they still returned to the families that they knew. And so these longitudinal studies started to reveal uh, gaps in our services, saying that kids needed to be in a home setting as long as possible, as much as possible, with people that know and love them, and the notion of institutionalizing children wasn't effective in terms of providing for a child later, giving them the skills they need to succeed later, nor to restore the family unit. And so, what happened was, in the state of California, some administrators said, what if we took money that would have funded children being placed in residential care, i.e. group homes, okay? And they said, what if we provided that money to pay for a team of individuals to start to repair the relationship between the biological family and the, ch the child, okay, to stabilize that placement because that child seems to go back to that biological family no matter what. So what if we strengthen the family so that they never had to leave and they never had to return being damaged, right? What if we preserved that family Okay, what we, uh, what we will hear, sometimes hear referred to in social work as family preservation. We will preserve the family unit, restore their health, okay? And as a result of that, our system and society will be better off. So they took that funding, okay, and applied it to this pilot program in 1992 called uh, Program Uplift, okay? And the results for this program were fantastic. So instead of pulling kids out of the home and placing them away only to return back to their families of origin when they were 18, what they did was they, they, they gathered a team of individuals who stepped into that family's home, worked on the relationships together, reported to the court on their progress, and said, we want this child and this family to be successful where they are in the community. It, was, it worked so well that in 1995, an assembly bill here, 2297, authorized the use of foster care funds for intensive in-home services as an alternative to out-of-home placement. This particularly happened in Santa Clara County. So what happened was they said, so this is looking good, this, this uplift program, let's go ahead and pilot this further, okay, in Santa Clara, um, and let's actually create a formal path of funding to provide services for these uh, children and families. Now in 1998, then, we took that a little further, Senate Bill 163 passed in the, um, pilot program allowed for other counties to participate in this program. So what you saw was what the origin of program uplift in Santa Clara County began to expand and open up to other counties. Other counties like Orange County, San Bernardino County, Riverside County, 
uh, all throughout the state of California began to implement wraparound and start to see these amazing outcomes. So instead of removing children from the home or when children had been removed and they were now returning to the biological families, they came with a wraparound team. And this wraparound team in particular is devoted to serving preserving this family unit, strengthening them, and then slowly what we, what, we, um, what we discuss is working our way out of a job so that family doesn't need us anymore, okay? Now, in 1999, then, the California Department of Social Services, which is the state governing agency over child welfare, all right, um, issued this notice, okay, which established standards to wrap. So they said, hey, this is great. There's all kinds of counties participating in wraparound and say that they're doing wrap, but it looks like everyone's kind of doing rap a little differently. Some are saying that it is rap, others are saying it's not. And there's a problem with that because what we found in wraparound, when I said trust the process, is if you follow the wraparound process and you believe in it, it works. I have worked with families where I thought to myself walking out of the first meeting, I don't know if this family is appropriate for wraparound. I'll be honest with you. I was worried at first saying, I think we overstepped. But it wasn't until I understood that we trusted in the process and we followed the process that I have seen amazing results coming from wraparound with children and families in particular. And so the state said, hey, if you are going to do wrap and receive wraparound funding from the state of California, your program needs to have certain things in place and there is a structure that you must follow in order to implement wrap. So folks, what I'm excited to give you in this course is the structure designed with these state standards for wraparound implementation that I have been, had the pleasure of utilizing, training, teaching, advocating for, for the past 15 years. So the training and the, the information that you're going to receive in this course is aligned with the California standards for wraparound implementation, okay? So um, at that point, the California Department of Services uh, contracted with EMQ, which is, you know, later changed the name to Uplift for state consultings. That's changed a little bit over the years. And um, California Department of Social Services still utilizes a relationship with UC Davis um, for extended training and wraparound implementation. And so um, um, there is still an involvement there, a relationship, okay, with UC Davis. And what we've seen now is an implementation of wraparound beyond, like I said, children and families. Veteran populations use, excuse me, wraparound individuals who are in hospital settings who have been hospitalized, okay, due to uh, chronic health conditions that have kept them out of home for extended periods of time, also receive wraparound teams in order to reintroduce them back into family units and life outside of the hospital once they're in there uh, for extended periods of time. So, so this is a model now that has been adopted nationally. If you're ever interested in receiving more information on wrap, you can also look at the uh, National Wraparound Initiative, NWI, and you can, uh, you can Google that and you'll see um, some of the latest discussions, research, um, and tips for practices and implementation related to RAP on a national level. All right, so that's enough history lesson for you all. Here's what I want to do, and I'm excited to give you, is the definition first. Yeah, sorry about that. Let's start with the definition of wraparound, and like I said, this comes from the National RAP Initiative, okay, which is considered more of that overarching, informative, um, RAP-oriented practice okay, and guidance center, if you will, for wraparound implementation. So some of you are saying, so what is RAP? Is RAP a program? Is RAP funding? Is RAP a process? What is it? So in recent years, wraparound has been most commonly conceived as a, what we refer to as intensive, individualized care planning and management process. So you notice we don't say wraparound is a treatment or wraparound is a program, even though there are wraparound programs. We are engaging the family, the client that we're working with in a process, a process. Wraparound is not a treatment per se. The wraparound process, okay, aims to achieve positive outcomes by providing a structured, creative, and individualized, do you hear the language in there? Team planning process compared to traditional treatment planning results and plans that are most more effective and more relevant to the child and family. That's a wordy way of saying that we need to be inclusive of the child and family that we're working with and your client. Instead of us going in way back in the ancient days of social work, establishing a plan and saying, here's what I think your problem is. I think that you test, uh, that you do too many drugs and I think you need to have a job and I think your family needs a food bank and I think blah, blah, blah. And then what would happen is you say, so I'm going to write that on your case plan. 
you're going to have a set time to do it. And if you don't accomplish this plan by this uh, time, there will be consequences. Consequences from the court, consequences from your family, maybe it's legal consequences, law enforcement consequences, whatever the case is. And oftentimes what we would do is we would hand that off and say, good luck. Wraparound doesn't do that. What wraparound does is it brings a team of individuals in who wrap around the client. And that client may be a veteran. That client may be someone who is hospitalized. That client may be a foster youth. That, that client may be a family, right? And what we say as a social worker is, where do we want to be both together, recognizing the needs of the court and the needs, more importantly, of you and your family? Right? What do we need to get there? What is the outcome we're trying to achieve? And we also consider, and I know this sounds a little scary to some of you, but we consider that the client is an expert in their own lives and that we therefore will have tips and needs on behalf of the system that we're representing, but we can never make progress without the buy-in and the, and the input of the client who we're serving. And we engage them in a process that is collaborative and structured and is individualized to that client's life. And so we recognize that when we see our client, we see our client for them, who they are as an individual, not as our caseload, okay? And so that's important to understand. So that is our definition of RAP. Now, in every program that's aligned with state standards for the state of California, wraparound needs to exhibit 10 principles. These 10 principles are the foundation of any RAP program. So any RAP program, all right, and this is why I would caution you, this is the challenge over the years that I've seen. When a program says, oh, we're providing wraparound, we're doing wraparound with clients. And I said, what are the 10 principles? If they cannot name, these 10 principles as a RAP program, they, don't, they are not aligned with the standards of RAP. A solid RAP program, what we call a RAP program that implements wraparound with high fidelity, has these 10 principles present in every single bit of programming that they provide. Um, the staff that they hire live these 10 principles out with their families. The supervisors that are present look for these 10 principles evident in their case plan, the case management plan, what we call the wraparound plan of care, all right, that is relevant um, and, and applies to the family. So this needs to weave its way through all services, okay? Now, really quickly, I'm not going to go through all of these 10 principles, but I just want to unpack a few of them so you kind of understand why these are so important. So these are the 10 principles. Strength-based, the wraparound teams are going to be strength-based. Family voice and choice is included in the process. Remember, not in the treatment, but in the process. Safety has to be considered. Wrap plans need to be collaborative. They need to be needs-driven. They need to be community-based, team-based, unconditional in their support to the client. They need to be natural, uh, involve natural supports. We're going to talk about that. And they need to be flexible in their approach in serving the client, okay? Now, what I'm going to do is, like I said before, many of you know that I'm a comic book nerd and Star Wars nerd, and so I'm going to make some analogies to some of these 10 principles of wraparound so you can kind of see how they come to life throughout the wraparound process, okay? Like I said, whenever I get a chance. So the first one is family voice and choice, okay? Family and youth child perspectives are intentionally elicited and prioritized during all phases in the wraparound process. Planning is grounded in family members' perspectives and the team strives to provide options and choices such that the plan reflects family values and preferences. That all sounds really nice, right? But let's look at this example here. We have, many of you may recognize this group as the Incredibles, right? And the Incredibles are a literally family of superheroes. And so this family of superheroes, in the course of engaging their obstacles, all right, come together as a family, discuss what their approach is going to be and how they're going to respond to the challenges placed in front of them. They involve the input of all family members. Now, when we are providing wraparound, all right, in a case management setting, what we need to do is listen to the client and ask for the client's input. In this case, if it was in a foster care setting, you would involve the actual client and the parents that are involved. And you would say, what do you all need from this process? And how are we going to incorporate your voice into our plan? Okay. This group right here, you may not recognize, uh, or maybe you do, when you see them together as a group, you may recognize them as the Fantastic Four, right? How many of you can actually um, um, identify each of these individual members, right? If I were to ask you, what is each individual member's name? Would you be able to do that? 
many of you may say, well, I know maybe one or two, but I don't know all of them. I know them as a team. And that's an important thing to consider when being team-based in a wraparound. The wraparound team consists of individuals who are coming together to, like I said, wrap around that identified client to provide them with community resources and support, all right, to strengthen their relationships. A good wraparound team isn't seen for just one team member. They don't say that's Antonio's wraparound team. They don't say that this, this is the facilitator's wraparound team. They don't say this is the therapist's wraparound team. They say they are a team and they are an effective team, all right? And they see the group of individuals as an effective unit in serving the client, okay? A couple more, natural supports. Let's go with this. I'm a Batman fan. And so many of you know, Batman doesn't have any superpowers, right? Batman doesn't shoot lasers. He doesn't fly from some magical power. Uh, spider didn't bite him and give him some crazy uh, skills, right? Superman's, I'm sorry, Batman, all of his special abilities come from gizmos that he builds, okay? Well, with his massive wealth, right? But the whole point of this is, is that Batman in and of itself relies on natural supports, things that he has around him in order to be stronger. A wraparound team needs to develop natural supports. In other words, the plan is when you're providing wraparound and case management to a client, you want to ask the question, what would this client, what would this family, what would this veteran, what would this person do if I wasn't here? If the answer is that they would fall on their face because you're not there to provide them with bus passes and you're not there to get them linked to food banks and they don't need to know, they don't know where to go to find a tutor or clothing, then we have failed them as social workers in providing case management. Natural supports means we come in and we see what is available in the community around them. We start to connect them to those natural supports, whatever that is, a church, a school, a coach, um, social services office, whatever the case is, and we establish an independence with them. All right, so that one day when we step out of the picture, that client, that family no longer needs us because they are surrounded by natural supports in their community, okay? Collaboration, many of you know this, and this is a, a, a group that you're all familiar with. These are the Avengers, right? And many of you know the Avengers, Avengers independently for who they are, right? So you know Iron Man, you know Black Widow, you know Captain America, you know the Hulk, you know Thor. Now, many of you also know, though, if you watch the movies, that the Avengers, every single time, not one Avenger, can solve the problem that's put ahead of them, right? So no one Avenger is above the team. No one Avenger has all the answers and can therefore solve the problem. They actually have to work together to save the world every single movie, right? And it's in fact, it's when the Avengers are fighting together as a team that they're able to solve the problems that are put ahead of them, okay? So they're big egos, they're big personalities, but they're ineffective if they are not working together. In collaboration with Wraparound, we do not go in and work solely as a social worker. So we don't do the Han Solo approach and saying, I am the social worker and you are the therapist. So therapists do therapy and don't offer any support, right? And we say, you are the pastor. So come in and say your prayer, but I don't need anything other, any other support from you other than that prayer. No, in collaboration, what we do is we bring everyone to the table. We bring everyone to the table to talk about the case plan, to offer input into the case plan, to agree on the strategies that we're going to implement, and then we move forward with the plan. So we collaborate with one another. Things like being community-based is important to understand. I don't know if many of you identify with this group at all, but this is a group, I don't know if you noticed, but Captain Planet. Um, I may be dating myself here, but you know, Captain Planet, he's our hero fighting pollution, all that kind of stuff. And so this is the whole point to get though, is that community-based, is that families need to be connected with their communities in which they live. Many times, some of our clients that come to us, not just children and families, but also veteran populations, individuals without housing are not rooted in their community. In fact, they live migratory lives. Many of our clients up and move, okay, because of stressors, trauma, they're running from someone, they're running for safety, or they're running from bills, or whatever the case is, and they move continuously. And what happens is the family becomes dependent upon welfare systems instead of the community in which they're in, and they're not grounded in that community. And so in wraparound, what we are doing is we're trying to establish roots with our clients to burrow in, all right, and to become part of a community, because in the community, we can access those natural supports. 
Culturally competent. I love this one because as you notice, these are transformers, right? And some of you may have had other classes meeting where we would talk about the notion of being culturally humble. All right, now culturally competent, you'll see this language here. This is still used by the state, but many of you have heard me preach to the term of being culturally humble. That's fine, let's go with that, okay? So what do transformers do? Transformers literally change their shape to the environment in which they're in, right? So these robots, but then they look like a car or they look like a truck or whatever the case is, all right? So you are who you are when you go into a home. You don't change your identity of who you are and who you believe or what you believe in when you go in to serve a family, but you do need to be culturally humble, which means that when I step into a home, I need to transform my attitude and my behavior, all right, to respect the culture in which I'm working with. And the culture doesn't always mean necessarily associated with race or ethnicity, right? Sometimes what we need to understand is that if you come from a middle-class income and you are stepping into a home in which an individual is of lower class, okay, or of a low socioeconomic status, what you want to understand is, is that we need to respect the culture of the home that we are stepping into. We need to honor some of those traditions or at least take an effort to acknowledge and understand the culture of a family unit. That's important to understand. So we are culturally humble in wraparound with our approach. We want to be individualized. Like I said before, no cookie cutter approaches, right? We want to tailor plans to the individual and to the group that we're serving in the wraparound process. We want to be strength-based, right? So right here we have the X-Men. Many of the folks that, that are opposed to the X-Men, if you're a comic book nerd and you know this, is that they're seen as freaks because of some of the special gifts they've been given. In Wraparound, we don't see the individuals as freaks for the, the gifts that they've been given. In fact, we said, oh, thank goodness, you have a strength that someone else doesn't have. There's something special about you that's different from the rest of us, and we need to highlight that strength to move us forward in the plan. So we are X-Men in this process of, of planning, all right, and engaging in our case management in a wraparound model. We look at the strengths of every single team member, even when we feel overwhelmed and we feel like there is so much negativity happening in this family unit or in their behaviors or whatever the case is, right? And we have to say, what are the strengths? We need to honor that every single team member has strengths. In fact, in a wraparound meeting, every single meeting, every meeting, all right, if I work with a family for three years, every meeting for three years begins with strengths. What are the positive things that are happening this week since we last met? We're gonna start with the positive. It doesn't mean we turn an eye to what needs to be worked on or safety or critical situations, but we will start with the strengths. We start with positivity, all right? And that's being strength-based in a wraparound model. Some of you may have seen the movies of Spider-Man recently, and I love these particular movies because I am not a Spider-Man fan. I actually really don't care for Spider-Man as a comic, but I'm sorry if I offended anyone in saying that. But here's the one thing that I love about the new Spider-Man movies. Spider-Man is persistent. Spider-Man keeps getting turned down by Tony Stark over and over and saying, make me a superhero. I wanna go out, I wanna be an Avenger, and I wanna fight. And every time Tony Stark says, no, you're not ready, you're too young, you're too inexperienced, whatever the case is. And Spider-Man finds himself in these situations where he ends up proving his value and his worth. And why? Because he is persistent, okay? And so one of the things that's really important to understand in wraparound, and I will say this from a perspective of not the county social worker that is overseeing the case in the courts, but the wraparound social worker who is leading the wraparound process with the family, uh, wraparound teams never say, in, in, in programs that I have supervised and teams that I've led, I have said, I never want to hear our wraparound team saying that there's nothing more we can do for a family or that we need to close services with a family that we're giving up on them. As the wrap providers, we are not the ones to ever say that we give up. We must remain persistent and continue to bring hope and strategies to the clients that we are serving. At some point, one of the professionals on the team that is tasked with assessing safety and risk, in that case would be the county social worker, is gonna be able to say, I admire the persistence, but maybe there's so much happening in the family unit right now that we wanna try wrap later once things have stabilized. But in a pure wraparound model, the wraparound team is not the one saying that we give up, we can't do this anymore. Even when the families are saying, I don't know if I can do this anymore, the wraparound team is persistent and pushes on. Finally, the last one that I want to drive through is coming from a lesson that Yoda talked about, right? So Yoda said, do or do not, there is no try, right? And so 
um, Yoda is outcome driven. Yoda wants to know you're going to do it or you're not, but you're not going to just try. Okay. So the wraparound team, like any good case management plan is going to begin with the end in mind. So what we're going to want to do is we're going to say, what are the outcomes that we want to achieve at the beginning of this wraparound process? What does each team member need to have see happen at the end of this process? That means the child, the family, the identified client, and the professionals. What do we all need to see at the beginning of this process and how are we going to get there? And we are going to make sure that our strategies and our plan is aligned with those outcomes. Outcome driven, okay? Beginning with the end in mind. All right. We're almost done here, folks. Hang with me. Sorry for this uh, odd um, uh, placement of this uh, slide here. I apologize for that. So what I want to do is show you now the wraparound process is very similar in its structure, very similarly to that of the in a, uh, interventionalist, um, the uh, generalist model for case management. So if you will notice, there are four phases of wraparound, okay, and they align very nicely with that generalist intervention model. So the phases of wraparound are engagement, planning, implementation, and transition. These are the four phases. Now, the reason why you have all these quirky lines here and triangles on the screen is to understand that in case management, and all right, I'm not talking about only wraparound, I'm talking about solid case management, then what you do here is these phases have different points in time and where some are stronger than the others and some start to back off at certain different points during your case management. So if you notice, there is no point in, in wraparound or in case management when we say that engagement stops. So we never say after the third week, you know what, we're, we're no longer in engagement phase and we are now moving family into the planning phase. Therefore, I have no, more any, uh, no longer any interest in your personal uh, interests or your hobbies or your likes, right? We're past engagement, so I will, I'm going to stop engaging with you. We never say that, right? Engagement starts from day one and it ends, um, and it follows through the end of the process. And the reason for that is because as social workers in case management, remember I said we operate with the head and the heart. We never stop feeling empathy for our clients. We never start enga stop engaging with them on a personal level. Yes, they are identified client, Yes, that they are our, um, our focus for our case plan. They are still a human being. They're still a mother, a father, a child, whatever the case is. And at that point, they still deserve the dignity to be treated like that person, okay? Second is plan development. So if you notice, in plan development, we start with a little less planning in the beginning. Well, that's because engagement is heavy. We need to get to know the family. We're still trying to understand what are their cultural norms, what brought them into the system to begin with, what are some of their um, desires for this process. And so it's into the middle of this as we get to move in, before we move into implementation, that we're saying, ah, I'm starting to understand now why the family may have encountered our system. I'm starting to understand now what the interests are and the cultural traditions are of mom or dad. I'm starting to understand some of the background related to previous mental health treatment or diagnosis of this child. And therefore, now I can start to come up with a plan together with the family on what it is we're going to work on. So if you notice, planning starts to get heavy right here, right before implementation. Now, if you notice here, implementation starts heavy right in the middle when you start, right? This is a lot of heavy lifting, okay? And then what happens is it starts to taper off at the end. Here's what's important to understand. In case, in case work, in case management as a social worker, the beginning phases of working with the family are gonna feel a little heavy for you as a professional at first because you're doing a lot of the heavy lifting. You're getting to know the family, you're getting the family to trust you as a professional representing the system. That's a lot easier said than done, right? I've showed up to homes where just because just because I am representing a system such as child welfare, I'm representing a county, whatever the case is, they will not let me in the door, right? They'll, they'll shut out the lights, they'll turn off the TV. I hear all kinds of whispering and I'm like, I know you guys are in there, right? Give me five minutes. And they are shutting you out, right? So you are building engagement, you're building rapport, you're still trying to develop a plan. And so when you first start implementing that plan, it's going to feel very professional heavy because you might be role modeling for them how to work their way through crisis. You're, you're brainstorming with them coping mechanisms on how to deal with stressors in their life, right? You're having discussions 
about maybe attending some parenting classes or getting resources for families for food banks or churches or whatever the case is. But if you notice, as you move through implementation, for the professionals, it starts to lighten up. The reason for that is because at some point, we need to hand the work over to the client that you are serving. At some point, you cannot end this process with you doing all the heavy lifting for the client or the family because we wouldn't have taught them how to do it for themselves, right? And if we answer, ask that question, what would, you, what would you do as a client, right, if I wasn't here? If they look at you and say, I don't know what I would do because you're not here to help me, and we have failed that client, right? And so what happens is we give opportunities, opportunities that are safe for families, just like a child that's walking, right? We don't sit there and we can't catch them every, sec, every, every time they fall. Sometimes that kiddo falls and we're there to pick them up, right? To dust them off, to tell them they're okay, and to let them continue to walk on their own. We need to do that with the clients that we are serving. At times, we're gonna watch our family struggle. We're gonna watch them fall. It's gonna be a little scary for us. And we're gonna say, oh my gosh, you have a plan, use the plan. Sometimes I may use some of it or none of it, but then we use that as a learning experience to come back and say, so next time, let's go with the plan that we had set up, let's see you implement it, and let's see how it goes, right? Finally, in the fourth step, we have transition here, transition. So if you notice though, here's what's interesting. Did you notice transition doesn't just happen at the end of the spectrum? Transition, look, begins at the beginning, right? Remember when I said begin with the end in mind. So we have to start with a goal. We have to start with an outcome. We have to see where do you want to be at the end of this process? What do you want to have, what do you want to have accomplished when we are done here, right? And as a result of that, then what we do is we move the family through that process. And so as we get closer to the end of our time together, as we move towards transition, right, then we will start to have more discussions about what life will look like without those professionals in place but we would have established natural supports within the community for, for our clients to be stronger and more empowered, right? To make decisions for themselves. So that is the four phases of wraparound. If you notice, they align beautifully with the general interventionist model. And this is why I'm spending time sharing wraparound with you, because this is going to mean the difference between uh, exposure in the field to a solid evidence informed practice such as wrap, um, as opposed to other, let's say less known, um, interventionist models, okay? Now, in a nutshell, I've thrown a lot at you regarding wraparound, its plan, its principles. So here's what I wanna do is just narrow down. So here's some big ideas. Here's a summary of what wraparound is, okay? Or relates to what we do with wraparound process. And then we'll end our time today. All right, so wraparound operates off the principle it takes a village to raise a child, right? If you notice, it doesn't say it takes one social worker to raise a child. Right? It doesn't say it takes one social worker to solve the client's problems. A social worker, we are conduits for the rest of the community and our resources, right? We're a hub, we're like the octopus. And so we've got this great brain in the center with all of these hands. And those hands, okay, are the teams, the individuals, the resources that we depend on to help reach out to the family in need. And so our job is to bring the village to our client. If our client's a foster youth, then that's what we're doing. If our client's a veteran, then that's what we're doing but it takes a village to come around our identified client to support them. RAP is a process and not a service. And so you'll sometimes hear this, right? I'll hear social workers all the time and from a RAP purist model, me who's been training in this for 15 years, I'll hear a social worker say, uh, we need to provide wraparound services to this client. And I'm like, oh, we don't provide wraparound services to a client, right? We engage our client in the wraparound process. Because what we've seen is, is a service is a strategy. A service is a prescribed um, um, action. A service is a tutor. A service is a food bank. A service is rental assistance. A service is utility checks, okay? A service is EBT cards. A service is something you prescribe because it serves a function. Wraparound is a process because it is engaging everyone together in a planning discussion, an ongoing discussion, and monitoring of the progress of a group, okay? And so therefore, we're not a service in RAP, we are a process, okay? Now, there's a saying in Wraparound, and I love this particular saying. This came from a, an amazing trainer of Wraparound, a guru of Wraparound, Patricia Miles, who I learned from earlier in my career. When you know what to do, do it. When you don't know what to do, do Wraparound, okay? Now the whole idea behind this is, 
If we know that a kid just needs to increase their English grades, then give them an English tutor. If we know that a family is going hungry and they need food, then give them a food bank. If we know that a mother needs prayer in her lives, um, in her life, and she needs to be connected with a, a faith-based community, then let's get her a church, right? If we know that a father needs to maintain his sobriety and he lost his sponsor, then he just gets a sponsor. But oftentimes, when the problems or challenges in a family or with a client become so complex that we don't know what to do anymore with that, then is the time to bring in wraparound, seeing how wraparound then becomes the process. So we're saying is that things are complex, things are heavy, and oftentimes a family saying, I don't know where to start. I am so consumed by substance dependency or anger or grief or running away or whatever the case is. I don't even know how to fix where I am. That's okay. When you don't know what to do, let's do wraparound. And that's where the idea of wraparound comes from, okay? Um, finally, wraparound, this is the phases that I mentioned to you before on that chart, right? So wraparound focuses on these four areas right here, engagement, planning, implementation, and transition. Your generalist intervention model follows the same timeline, okay? Now what happens is before the process, you're gonna have referrals and screening. This is where yours, you as a social worker are sitting in your cubicle and you're at your desk and you're doing some paperwork and your supervisor comes over and says, congratulations, you just got another case. Here is your referral packet. Here's all the screening and intake information. Have at it, okay? There's some points in my career as a social worker where I'm sitting on my desk and I've got 13 cases piled up right here and I'm trying to get through my notes and guess what? Supervisor comes over with another 10. Boom, right on your desk, okay? That's that process that happens before you begin engaging the family. And afterwards in wraparound as well as in the general intervention model, we have a period of time when the case closes that we follow up with the family. Sometimes that's individuals taking surveys. Sometimes that's us bringing a few more resources. Sometimes that's the client reaching back out to us saying, hey, things are going well overall. I just had a couple questions for you. I need a little bit of guidance. Can you help me? And that is that post-work, post-transitional work, okay? In the general intervention model, you have that. And in wraparound, we refer to it as post-wrap. What is wrap like? Okay, what is life like after, after wraparound has ended, okay? So those are the four phrases. The reason why you'll see arrows moving back and forth here, dual direction here, is because in a wraparound model, and it's important to understand in case management too, in the general interventionist model, okay, you may move back into some phases. So you can be in engagement and you're moving along, right? And then you may go into planning and things look good. You feel really good about your plan. And then you start to implement it. And nothing in your plan is working. In fact, you start to, see, start to see things getting worse, right? You start to see more crisis, more anger, uh, more no-shows for appointments, whatever the case is. At that point, then, as a social worker, you say, whoa, 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 step back, hold on. Okay, we have moved forward with implementing a plan, but we're not seeing progress, at least the progress that we wanted to see. So I'd like to move back into planning this week. I'd like to talk about the strategies that we set up, the needs that we identified, is this what we're still committed to doing as a family or as a group? Is this what we still want? Because I'm noticing as we move forward, we're not getting the outcomes that we need. So let's step back for a second. Let's look at our plan and let's make sure this is the plan that we want to work, okay? So do you see how you can move back and forth between any of these systems? All right. So I want to say really quickly, thank you so much for listening to the lecture. Now I know this is a lot of information to get in a very short period of time, okay? So please know that if you feel overwhelmed with what we're talking about in case management, if you feel a little confused, you don't need to worry. In fact, you're feeling like a lot of other folks that are first introduced to wraparound. I'm not gonna lie to you. I, 15 years ago, received this training, right? Before I became a certified trainer for trainer, before I started doing advocacy at the state level, I was receiving this training and I was thinking to myself, this sounds great and exciting, but it sounds so overwhelming. If you're feeling that way, don't worry, you're gonna be absolutely okay. You can shoot me an email, you can talk to me about what's, what you're going through, whatever the case is, and I'm happy to guide you through it, okay? Um, likewise, if you have any suggestions, if you need me to explain something better, just let me know that and I'll be happy to do that, okay? Um, finally, let's go ahead and close out with our centering for today, right? So our um, centering, just a reminder, right? We're gonna spend two minutes pushing out all of that information that we just received right now. We're not gonna worry about what came before today's lecture. We're not gonna worry about what is gonna happen after this lecture is done, right? 
we're going to go ahead and take some comfort, right, in knowing that God was present with us since our day began, and God's present with us even when we close our eyes to sleep at night, right? He's forever with us, okay? And so our scripture focus word, or sorry, scripture focus word for today will be interconnectedness, interconnectedness, okay? And our scripture verse will come from 1 Corinthians chapter 12. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. So today's lecture on wraparound, if you notice, has had this theme of connectedness that we are a team, right? We don't operate as a social worker alone. To some of us, that may be, may be scary, right? Because you're saying, well, we're dependent upon others for progress. Maybe. But also, you could take comfort in also knowing that you're not alone. That the sole outcome of a family, of a client, of an adult, of a veteran, of a homeless individual that you're working with under a case management model isn't all dependent upon you, right? That, that, that a person's life and their success later in life isn't solely dependent upon you as a social worker. It's a team effort, right? And so how is God in the next two minutes speaking to you about this notion of if one member suffers, all suffer together. And if one member is honored, all rejoice together. And how is God speaking of this notion of interconnectedness in your life? So let's go ahead and make sure our hands and feet are in a nice comfortable position. Let's go ahead and take a nice deep breath. Let's reflect, close our eyes, and I'll keep track of the time. Okay, go ahead and take a nice deep breath. Open your eyes, welcome back. Folks, thank you so much for engaging in the lecture today. If this is you down here, if you're saying to yourself, wow, I'm feeling overwhelmed, I'm feeling nervous, like I said before, please don't feel nervous, stop for a second, center, right? Just give yourself some time to say, things are gonna be okay, I'm not going through this alone, right? I've got other colleagues around me who are going through this who are overwhelmed, but also, all right, I've got God alongside me, all right? I'm not alone in this process. Just a reminder, please check Blackboard, all right, um, for uh, assignments and due dates of work that you have for the course. Reach out to me with any questions you have. You are not bothering me. I am here for you and know that I continue to pray for you as we move through this process. So, so thank you all so much, um, and I will see you at the next lecture. Take care.